Good afternoon. During today's, today's legislative hearing, we will consider the following bills. S-2908, the Indian Buffalo Management Act. S-3263, the Porch Band of Creek Indians Parity Act. S-4000, a bill to reaffirm the applicability of the Indian Reorganization Act to the Lytton Rancheria of California and for other purposes. And S-4442, the Crow Water Rights Settlement Act a Settlement Amendment Act of 2024. Before we begin, I want to say a few words about the Supreme Court's misguided decision in Carcieri v. Salazar. The Carcieri decision put rebuilding tribal homelands into a tailspin, and for 15 years it has slowed Interior's land into trust process and frustrated Indian country, increased administrative costs, and spurred often needless litigation. So, I think we're all clear that we support legislation to fix Carcieri for all tribes. I share Indian country's frustration with Congress's failure to pass a universal fix. But we have to recognize that Congress has acted on tribal-specific legislation before, and Senator Britt's and Senator Padilla's bills are in line with those past successful efforts. With that, I'll briefly describe today's bill with a more fulsome description uh, entered into the record. S-2908 was introduced by Senators Heinrich and Mullen. The bill would establish a buffalo management program at BIA to help tribes and tribal organizations manage buffalo herds and habitat for cultural, subsistence, and economic development purposes. S-3263 was introduced by Senator Britt and Senator Tuberville. This bill would reaffirm the Indian Reorganization Act's applicability to the porch band of Creek Indians and ratify the trust status of lands the tribe previously acquired administratively. S-4000 was introduced by Senator Padilla. The bill would reaffirm, reaffirm the Indian Reorganization Act's applicability to the Lytton Rancheria of California and clarify that the tribe is eligible to have its lands taken into trust through the Department of Interior's land into trust process. Our final bill on the agenda is S-4442, introduced by Senator Tester and Senator Daines. This bill would amend the Crow tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2010 to change the scope of the water infrastructure system authorized under that act to provide the Crow Tribe more flexibility in developing regional irrigation and municipal and industrial water product projects and to allow the tribe additional time to develop hydropower projects to deliver clean energy and water to the reservation. Before I turn to the Vice Chair for her opening statement, I'd like to extend our welcome and thanks to the witnesses for joining us today. I look forward to your testimony and our discussion. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate today's hearing. You've covered uh, much of the details of the bills that will be before us. I want to just discuss quickly S-2908, the Indian Buffalo Management Act. It says impacts on my state. It would make permanent, small, but important program operated by the BIA that's rebuilding buffalo populations on tribal lands. The Indian Buffalo Management Act was first introduced in the House during the 116th Congress by my, my friend and uh, Alaska's Congressman, Congressman Don Young. We, we know the history, the story of, of the Plains bison and how they were a vital source of, of food and nutrition for native people. Tens of millions of buffalo once roamed the West until they were decimated in the 1800s uh, by misguided and inhumane policies of the forest removal area. Today, the federal government is partnering with tribes and tribal organizations like the Intertribal Buffalo Council to reestablish bison herds. I never know whether to say bison or bison. I, I think it depends on the part of country you're in. Uh, take it whichever way it makes you happiest. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is again, reestablish these herds for economic development as a traditional food source and to provide food security for native communities. We have two communities in Alaska, Old Harbor and Stevens Village, that are part of this. Both communities manage herds that total around 500 buffalo. So now it's buffalo, not bison. But this is, this is a new subsistence species for them. Some of the bison in Alaska today were rounded up and relocated from the lower 48 with assistance from the buffalo program. In recent years, Interior has assisted with the transfer of surplus bulls from Yellowstone National Park to Alaska. So you ask the question, how do they get from Yellowstone to Alaska? They, they put these one-ton animals on a FedEx plane and then they transport them by barge, a truck, and occasionally helicopter to their new homes. 
once they make it to places like Kodiak Island, they roam free and have a pretty good life there. But as the original sponsor of the Indian Buffalo Management Act, Don Young understood that the BIA program could be utilized to improve the health and genetic diversity of the herds in our state. But in order to build this food source, resources are needed to cover the cost of transporting more cows, calves, and mobile slaughter facilities to the interior villages. As you can imagine, it's not cheap, um, but uh, looking forward to additional resources to help not only develop the program, but to expand training and educational opportunities for the tribal herd managers. So it's a good bill. Um, I'm pleased that... Uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Newland is here. We'll have some questions for him on that, but appreciate the testimony of the, the witnesses that are before the committee here today. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, uh, Senator Tester, and then I'm going to um, go a little bit out of order and have uh, Senator Heinrich introduce his, uh, make some opening remarks because he has to chair a different hearing. Senator Tester. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman uh, and Vice Chair Murkowski. Uh, this is a, a really good hearing. I commend you both for having it. Uh, important bills that need to get advanced, uh, and today is the start of that. I also want to thank Chairman White Clay for being here today. Uh, Chairman White Clay is leader of the Crow Tribe. I'm grateful for his strong leadership and uh, on important issues like law enforcement, physical management, infrastructure. Uh, th this Crow Water Bill in front of this committee today is an example, ex excellent example of good work that the chairman's doing serving his tribe. This bill would not be in the shape it is today without a strong leadership, and we thank you for that. I also want to recognize my friend, Irv, Irv Carlson. Uh, Irv, it is great to have you here, a uh, member of the Blackfeet tribe, a longtime champion for Indian Buffalo Management. Um, I'm glad to see the Buffalo Management Act getting a hearing. I think it's a very important piece of legislation, but I want to talk a minute about water and the, the Crow water bill that's on today's agenda. Many years ago, my native friends told me that water is life, and it is for all life. Uh, it powers Montana's economies. It's critical to the health of our communities. It connects us together. And that is why it's critical that the Crow Tribe has the tools and the infrastructure they need to deliver clean, clean water to its communities. This bipartisan Crow Water Settlement Amendments Act will do exactly that. It will provide the tribe vital flexibility in developing water infrastructure using the most up-to-date technology to create water systems that are more cost-effective and work for the Crow Tribe and the region. It will also bolster energy development by extending the timeline for the tribe to develop hydropower on the Yellowtail After Bay Dam until 2030, providing clean energy that will provide an economic boost to the Crow community. And Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, I'm pleased to share that we can accomplish all this with no additional cost, without changing any existing water rights, and without reopening the water settlement. The Crow Water Settlement Amendments Act is a simple, made in Montana solution that's going to help the Crow Tribe develop the infrastructure needed to deliver clean water to the folks for years to come. Lastly, I want to quickly uh, add that I am glad to see the, the porch bill. And Katie Brett, thank you very, very much for your leadership on this. It's a long time coming. And the Litton bills, and if Senator Padilla was here, I'd say the same thing to him. Those bills are important. These bills would restore the Secretary of Interior's authority to take land into trust for the tribes. I am a long supporter uh, of this effort following the unfortunate 2009 Supreme Court decision that wrongly deprived some tribes from having land taken into trust. With that, once again, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, thank you for having this hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Tester, and thank you for your leadership on all of these issues. Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman Schatz, and I want to thank Vice Chairman Murkowski for your words as well. Uh, several years ago, I was proud to lead, along with Senator Hoven, uh, the effort to designate the bison as our national mammal. This species has been a critical part of our culture in New Mexico, across the West, most especially in Indian country. The growth of tribal buffalo herds over the last few decades is both a symbol of the enduring resilience of this iconic species and a major economic development opportunity for many tribes. Dozens of tribes, and several in New Mexico, including the Pueblos of Taos and Picaris, Pohuaki and Sandia, have done important work to establish tribal buffalo herds on their lands. I have been privileged to see this firsthand. Two years ago, I visited Picaris Pueblo and went out with their herd manager, Danny Sam, to see their operation up close. I learned about how the community is reincorporating bison meat back into their diets. And the tribal herd at Picaris has allowed the Pueblo to distribute much of that healthy, 
locally grown, culturally important protein to the community for free. Our bipartisan, bicameral bill, the Indian Buffalo Management Act, would strengthen federal support for tribal bison programs like the one I saw at Picaris. It would authorize a permanent program at Interior and provide dedicated funding to promote and develop capacity for tribes to manage those buffalo herds. As you'll hear from Irv Carlson from the Intertribal Buffalo Council, establishing and managing a new bison herd is a resource intensive process for tribes. And there's a very real need for technical and resource support. And I want to thank you, Irv and ITBC, for all of your guidance, all of your feedback that helped us as we drafted this legislation and for your organization's support for tribal bison herds really all across Indian country. I'd also like to thank my Republican partner on this bill, Senator Mark Wayne Mullen, and our bipartisan co-leads in the House, Representatives Doug LaMolfa and Mary Peltola. And finally, I would be remiss if I did not also recognize the late Representative Don Young, who is one of the original leaders in this effort in Congress. Thank you, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairman Murkowski for giving me time to speak on this bill. And I hope that in my lifetime, thanks in large part to these tribal buffalo herds, we will see bison return to the prominent place that it once occupied as a keystone species on America's short grass prairies. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Heinrich. I'll now turn to our witnesses. We're happy to see uh, the, the most frequent of frequent flyers in this committee, the Honorable Brian Newland, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of Inter Interior, welcome. Uh, the Honorable Andy Mejia, uh, the Chairperson of the Lytton Rancheria in California, in Windsor, California. Uh, Mr. Irv Carlson, Senior, President of the Inter-Tribal Buffalo Council in Rapid City, South Dakota. And Senator Tester, uh, would you do the honors of, of introducing our next witness? It would, it would be an honor to do the honors. Uh, Chairman Whiteclay, who I addressed in my opening statement, is uh, leader of the Crow Tribe. Uh, I would just tell you when Chairman Whiteclay took over, the Crow Tribe was not under the best of leadership, and that's being generous. Um, Frank stepped forward. He put financial responsibility as a key part of his administration, and he's working hard to make sure it remains that way. He put law enforcement as a keystone of his, his administration. He's working hard to keep Crow Country safe. And this bill deals with infrastructure, and that's another area that, that, that Chairman uh, White Clay has done great work on. It is great to have you here. I know this is not an easy trip to make, but we certainly appreciate you making the trip. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Tester, and we're, we're pleased to have Senator Britt to both introduce uh, her guest and talk a little bit about the legislation pending before the committee. Senator Britt. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity, Chair Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski, for um, the ability to be here today and introduce Stephanie Bryan, the Porch Creek Indians Tribal Chair and Chief Executive Officer to this committee today. Stephanie, it is an honor to introduce you. Chairwoman Bryan is here testifying to S3262, the Porch Band of Creek Indians Parity Act. This bill is intended to clarify that the Porch Band of Creek Indians should be considered as now under federal jurisdiction for the purposes of the Indian Reorganization Act. The Porch Band of Creek Indians is a critical part of Alabama's culture and heritage. As a leader of the Porch Nation, Chairwoman Bryan represents the tribe's interest at both the state and national level. She is nationally recognized as an advocate on issues critically important to Indian country and serves in several significant national roles. In Alabama, Chairwoman Bryan works directly with the governor, state agencies, and local leaders. Her service in her community and on the state leadership and state leadership positions is truly incredible. She serves on the Business Council of Alabama's Executive Committee, Leadership Alabama, Montgomery Area Chamber of Commerce, Mobile Area Chambers of Commerce, just to name a few. And through these roles, she contributes directly to the growth of our great state. She has also been instrumental in growing the Porch Creek Tribe's business portfolio. Last year, Business Alabama recognized her as the publication's first ever CEO of the year. The Porch Creek Indians have a growing business supporting the Department of Defense, NASA, and the tribe continues to reinvest 
over a billion dollars just in the last decade alone into over 40 businesses across a range of industries. Chairwoman Brian, thank you for testifying today. We are grateful for your service to the community, the state, our nation, and the tribe. We are excited to have you here. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Britt. Uh, are there any other members wishing to make an opening statement? If not, I want to remind our witnesses that your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record. And so if you could please keep your remarks to five minutes or fewer, uh, the committee would appreciate that. And we will start with Assistant Secretary Newland. Please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brian Newland. I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, and I'm glad to be back again in front of uh, the committee to testify on these four bills. And I want to say uh, right from the get-go that the department supports passage of each of these bills. S-2908, the Indian Buffalo Management Act, would establish a permanent program within the department to develop, promote, and support tribal management of buffalo and buffalo habitat on Indian lands. This bill would also authorize $14 million in annual appropriations to support this work. This legislation will advance food sovereignty and support the protection and revitalization of cultural practices for tribes all across the United States. It will also support the department's efforts to work with tribes in co-stewardship of ecosystems and wildlife. S-3263 and S-4000 would ensure that the Porch Band of Creek Indians and the Lytton Band of Pomo Indians have the ability to restore and protect their tribal homelands under the Indian Reorganization Act. Since the Cartier decision, the department must examine whether each tribe seeking to have land placed in the trust under the Indian Reorganization Act was, quote, under federal jurisdiction in 1934. This analysis is done on a tribe-by-tribe -tribe basis and is both time-consuming and costly for tribes as well as the department. The ability to restore and protect tribal homelands is an important part of our trust responsibility, and it's been the policy of the United States for nearly a full century. In addition to S-3263 and S-4000, the department has consistently expressed strong support for a universal legislative solution to the Cartier decision for all tribes. The department urges Congress to consider a legislative fix to the Cartier decision for all tribes to eliminate the need for each tribe to seek its own separate legislation. S4442 would amend the Crow Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2010 by establishing a non-trust fund account to allow the Bureau of Reclamation to continue work on rehabbing the Crow Irrigation Project and a new municipal, rural, and industrial projects trust fund to be used by the Crow tribe for specified purposes. This administration recognizes that water is a sacred and valuable resource for tribes and that long-standing water crises continue to undermine public health and economic development all across Indian country. Access to water is fundamental to human existence and economic opportunity, and that is no less true for people in tribal communities. This bill would not increase funding for the Settlement Act. Instead, it simply changes the way some of the funds are held and expended. When the Crow, right, when the Crow Water Rights Settlement Act, that's hard to say all at once, when that law was passed, it did not provide for the creation of a non-trust interest bearing account for funds appropriated for project construction. More recent Indian water rights settlements have provided for such accounts to allow funds to accrue interest while projects are being planned, designed, and constructed. This bill would authorize the establishment of a non-trust interest-bearing account in Treasury to receive the funds already appropriated, as well as future appropriations for the Crow Irrigation Project Rehabilitation. S-4442 would convert the MRNI portion of that Settlement Act from an infrastructure-based settlement to a trust fund-based settlement. It would direct the Secretary to establish in the existing Crow Tribe Water Rights Settlement Trust Fund a new MRNI projects account. The tribe would use funds from this account for several purposes. Planning, designing, and constructing MRNI systems, planning, designing, and constructing wastewater treatment facilities, and purchasing on-reservation land with water rights. And finally, this bill would extend the period during which the tribe has the exclusive right 
to develop hydropower at the Yellowtail After Bay Dam until 2030. Again, the department is pleased to support each of these bills and is willing to provide further technical assistance to sponsors and members of the committee upon request. Chairman Schatz and members of the committee, I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Secretary Newland, and we are pleased to welcome uh, Chair Bryan. Uh, please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Mikowski, and members of the committee. My name is Stephanie Bryan, and I am honored to be the Chair and CEO of the Porch Band of Creek Indians. I greatly appreciate this opportunity to testify today about the Porch Band of Creek Indians Parity Act. And I want to thank Senator Britt and Coach Tuberwell for introducing this bill. The Porch Band of Creek Indians has been a leading advocate for a national Cartier fix to clarify that the Indian Reorganization Act applies to all federally recognized tribes. We offer our full support to the Tester Moran Bill, Senate Bill 563, which would accomplish that goal. We will continue to work to pass a national fix, but our tribe, like many others, has been forced to take a parallel approach by working with our congressional delegation to clarify that the IRA applies to our tribe. For decades, Porch Creek leaders have balanced the desire to preserve our tribe's history and culture with the need to rebuild our community and provide basic services to our citizens. Today, we're blessed to be able to provide our tribal citizens and neighbors with essential services that include police and fire protection, health care, elder care, education, and infrastructure. We've made careful decisions about how best to use our resources and our property, but we have a limited land base and we can't meet the growing needs for housing and other essential services for our citizens. In 2018, it became clear that we needed to expand our Boys and Girls Club, but we didn't have the land, trust land, so that cost us a million dollars to do an area where our ponds are located. But we're not alone. Tribal governments nationwide have a shortage of usable trust land and seek to acquire trust lands to meet basic needs of our people. The Supreme Court's 2009 Cartier decision upended the Interior Department's land into trust process. That decision placed a cloud of uncertainty over tribal trust lands, impeding investment and economic development in Indian country. It has led to frivolous lawsuits challenging the status of these trust lands. The tribe has spent almost $10 million to defend ourselves against attacks on our sovereignty. Thankfully, every court reviewing these frivolous cases has upheld the status of our lands, which the Interior placed in trust decades ago. However, these lawsuits have not have taken a toll and that's why our tribe is seeking a legislative solution that will provide us with much needed clarity. Our bill affirms that the IRA applies to our tribe and it allows us to be treated fairly like other federally recognized tribes. These frivolous lawsuits have not just hurt us, they've cost taxpayer dollars because the Interior Department and DOJ have had to use their budgets to defend our trust lands. This bill has strong support from the Alabama congressional delegation, also the cities and counties that surround us. I respectfully ask the committee to mark up Senate Bill 3263 and pass the bill before the end of the year. On behalf of our tribe, I'm honored to testify today and will answer any questions that you may have. Mado. 
Thank you very much. Chair Mejia, please uh, proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Chotz, Vice Chair Mikowski, and members of the Committee on Indian Affairs. My name is Andy Mejia, Chairperson of the Litton Rancheria of California, a tribe based in Sonoma County. Thank you for allowing me to be here today to speak in support of S-4000, a technical amendment to reaffirm that the Indian Reorganization Act applies to the tribe. I'd like to thank Senator Padilla for introducing this bill and for his work on behalf of Indian Country. If enacted, S-4000 would only clarify the intent of previous legislation and confirm that the Linton Rancheria is able to take land into trust through the administrative process, as other tribes nationwide and in Sonoma County are able to do. The bill itself does not take any lands into trust, but only makes explicit that the tribe is able to go through the Department of the Interior's approval process. On behalf of the members of the Linton Rancheria of California, I ask that you support S-4000. In 1995, Madam Chairwoman March Mejia was elected chairperson of the Lytton Rancheria of California Tribe. She was my mother. At that point in time, we were a landless and penniless tribe. Madam Chairwoman had three promises during her tenure. That was self-sufficiency, land, and housing. The promise of self-sufficiency was accomplished by establishing San Pablo Lytton Casino in the city of San Pablo, California, which is one of the most successful Class II gaming facilities in the, in the nation. Due to the success of San Pablo Linton Casino and under Madam Chairwoman's leadership, the tribe has been able to purchase almost 3,000 acres in land in Sonoma County. Of that 3,000 acres, 800 acres being high in vineyard. Madam Chairwoman fought tirelessly for 12 years to take 511 acres into trust to build a 146 home housing development and fulfill her last promise to the tribe. In 2019, that 511 acres was taken into trust through the legislative process and construction began in January of 2020. On October 19, 2022, Madam Chairwoman, my mom passed away unexpectedly at the age of 66. And it truly breaks my heart that my mom's not here to enjoy the fruits of her hard work, dedication, sacrifice, and the legacy she leaves behind after her 27 year tenure. No tribe should have to spend 12 years taking land into trust. Construction of the Linton homeland was completed this January. It's a very pinnacle moment for our tribe as we navigate through the process of bringing tribal member families back to their Aboriginal land. The Linton Rancheria has become a prime example of all that Eager can do for Indian country. We presently only ask to be placed on the same footing as other federally recognized tribes. This bill makes it explicit that the IRA applies to the tribe it does not itself take any land into trust, but only allows the tribe to apply through the interior's land into trust process as neighboring tribes are able to do. Thank you for your time. I would be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. And um, I'm sorry for the loss of your mother and may her memory be a blessing. Chairman White Clay, thank you for being here. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz. Vice Chair Murkowski, honorable members of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. Thank you, Senator Tester. <clears throat> I'm Frank Whiteley. I'm chairman of the Crow Nation, home to approximately 7,500 of the total 14,350 plus members of the Crow Tribe. The Crow Tribe negotiated a water compact with the state of Montana. Montana that was adopted by the Montana legislature in 1999 that provides water from surface flow, groundwater, and storage for the Crow tribe and protects all state and tribal current water users and the states of future water users in the compact. The compact was ratified by Crow Water Rights Settlement Act of 2010 and the act also provides for the rehabilitation and improvement of the Crow Irrigation Project a project owned and operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, construction of municipal, rural, and industrial water system for the delivery of clean drinking water, 
provides tribal water rights for tribes. The tribe and the Lotis identify storage of water in the Bighorn Lake of 300,000 acre feet per year in addition to the 500,000 acre feet in the Bighorn and all groundwater on the Crow Reservation provides the exclusive right of the tribe to develop and market power generation on the Yellowtail after Bay Dam. I'm here to support the amendments uh, on S442. The amendments to the act to revise it from a project-based settlement to a fund-based settlement that will allow flexibility on delivery of clean water. Additionally, the amendments act will extend the upcoming deadline on the exclusive right to develop the power generation project. The tribe completed engineering for the water intake facility on the Bighorn in 2022 and advertised bids for construction and we received no bidders this led to the tribe to reconsider the viability of the mrni system pipeline and i we identified the following concerns the pipeline construction was approximately 20 years at a cost of 400 million plus with an expectation that estimated construction costs will rise which they did with the supply chain rise in materials, likely resulting in a shortfall to complete construction. Pipeline construction will be daunting with the size of the reservation, 2.4 million acres across varying geographical features. The pipeline construction time frame would result in a lengthy delay, delay of water delivery for reservation communities, and some communities would wait many years for clear drinking water and others would not receive it at all. The water settlement included a finite amount for operation, maintenance, and replacement costs, which other water settlements have in perpetuity operation maintenance costs. Um, the Water Settlement Act did not include a mandatory hookup for households along the pipeline, leaving the number of actual customers unknown. However, if tribal household was hooked up to a pipeline monthly, consumer cost to cover oper operational costs would be approximately one twenty per month in today's dollars, which would burden an already impoverished reservation households. Private landowners were unwilling to grant temporary permits to cross lands for water sampling and testing for placement of the water intake unit closer to reservation communities which resulted in moving the intake to tribal lands at the after Yellowtail After Bay, a location much further from the reservation's large, larger communities. The Environmental Protection Agency expressed concerns to the BOR in a letter dated October 31st, 2022, with the location of the intake unit resulting in a water age concern for most and the Customers and the proposed use of complex chemicals treatments would necessitate operators with advanced certification requirements. The tribe is proposing to move the funds into a trust account for federal management and which draw upon approval to develop clean water. On behalf of the Crow Tribal membership, I am hopeful that the Crow Water Settlement Amendment Acts will be adopted in this congressional session. Thank you. Thank you very much. President Carlson, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair uh, Murkowski, and Honorable Committee members. My name is Irvin Carlson, and I'm a member of the Blackfeet Nation and uh, President of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. Um, I have submitted a detailed statement that I will now summarize. All natives in this country depended on the Plains Buffalo for survival prior to the arrival of the non-Indian into this continent. Buffalo were central to the native lifestyle and provided food, shelter, clothing, essential tools for our way of life. They symbolized survival and became central to our spirituality and religious practices. Our people refer to the Buffalo as my relative to signify how spiritually we were connected to them. Our oral history includes details of the vast 
number of buffalo between 30 and 60 million inhabiting North America. Due to wanton and unbridled overhunting by non-Indian buffalo hunters, millions and millions of our buffalo were slaughtered. The destruction was so complete that by the late 1800s, only a few hundred buffalo remained. Many great leaders mourned the loss of the buffalo and the native way of life. With the destruction of the buffalo and the Indian wars, the population of the Indian people, once numbering in the millions, dropped to approximately 250,000 by the early 1900s. Without the buffalo, surviving Indians were forced to live on reservations, losing their independence. Historical records show that the U.S. military participated in near extinction of the buffalo as it provided a way to deal with their Indian problem. Tribal leaders longed to restore buffalo but had minimal land bases and resources. However, early conservationists, including Teddy Roosevelt, had the means to prevent the near extinction of buffalo. For the Indian people, recovery from this devastation to restoration of buffalo herds on our lands began earnest in 1991, when a handful of Indian tribes organized the Intertribal Bison Cooperative, now known as the Intertribal Buffalo Council. We were granted a federal charter in 2009 pursuant to the Indian Reorganization Act. Our organization has grown significantly, and today I'm proud to tell you that we have 83 tribes in 22 states, all dedicated to restoring herds on our lands. The Indian population of our member tribes exceeds 1 million people. We greatly appreciate that Senators Heinrich, Mullen, Sullivan, and Tester have introduced S-2908, the Indian Buffalo Management Act. This is the successor to legislation initially introduced by the late Don Young. And I guess I should say to my, my way, um, the great Don Young. In which he got through the house before, before he left us. Congressman Lamalfa, Congressman Peltola, and others have reintroduced it in this Congress. In March, it was unanimously reported out of the House Committee on Natural Resources. It is pretty basic legislation that will create a program at the Interior Department to assist tribes and organizations like ours in restoring buffalo herds to tribal lands. It requires strict compliance with state and federal laws governing the translocation of buffalo and we had extensive discussions with the cattle industry and agreed to a series of changes they requested to ensure Buffalo did not detract from off-reservation cattle operations. By enacting this legislation, Congress will commit to assisting tribes to restore Buffalo herds. We believe that this legislation will help Interior to justify decent budgets for the Buffalo program as opposed to the minimal and stagnant funds that we have seen for decades, despite the huge growth in our membership. When you try and divide up <clears throat> 1.4 million among many tribes, it doesn't go very far. Tribes need fencing, watering systems, genetic diversity in their herds, supplemental feed, and testing that all require meaningful funds. Some tribes tell us they wish to reestablish herds for cultural purposes and that a small herd would be sufficient as a means of teaching children the history of our people and this great animal and having all of the parts of this animal uh, for our spiritual ceremonies. Others wish to create jobs, use the meat in the school lunch program, and for community events, and still others hope to grow their herds 
large enough to get into small-scale commercial, commercial production. Our members in Alaska have referenced the need for protein and basic food security, especially when successful subsistence hunts cannot be ensured. Whatever the reason, this legislation is very important to advance food sovereignty for native populations. And we sincerely hope that you will help to see it enacted um, into law this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, President Carlson. Senator Tester. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, um, appreciate the flexibility. Uh, uh, this goes uh, for you, uh, Chairman White Clay. Um, you talked about, in your statement, you talked about why the settlement doesn't work after the fact, the no bidders, construction time too long, uh, delay in water delivery, um, the list was long. And I know this is what the bill says, but I want you to flesh this out a little more. You said this will set up a trust account to develop clean water. Tell me what you're going to do to replace that pipeline to deliver clean water to the people in Crow Country, because if we get this bill passed, what will it allow you to do? Because you're not going to build a big old pipeline. You're not going to build an intake that's too far away. Um, so tell me what you're going to do. Thank you, uh, Senator Tesser. Yes, um, the Crow Tribe is planning on putting regional water plants throughout the, to each individual community. Um, the regional water plants will not be from surface water. It will be to the aquifer, which... We requested a study, aquifer study, to be done. To, um, thankful to the BIA for paying for that study. And um, we have more than adequate drinking water. It's safe. It's clean um, throughout. So each, like we said, our reservation is large, very large. So within all those communities, that will we will put regional water plants to all the communities and we'll have well systems for the rural Folks, we have a lot of folks that live in the country. Um, I myself haul water to my own residence through a cistern. So, giving us the ability to have wells to all the community members, which is roughly about sixteen hundred and eighty households. And in the end, do you think you can deliver this at or less of a cost than the pipeline would have run you, assuming you would have gotten bidders for the pipeline? <laughs> Yes, um, we can. We are very confident that we would be able to build the whole system out and include um, the wastewater systems and all the above under the okay. amount. Uh, I want to talk about the hydro project that you have, uh, and this bill also addresses it. I believe it moves up the deadline to 2030. What's the deadline right now? Yes. <clears throat> um, the previous settlement, or the settlement has a sunset date through there in 2025, um, okay. and it doesn't give a clear statement of substantial completion, so okay. this moves that Okay, forward. and so that, that substantial completion statement is further fleshed out and clarified? Yes. Okay, and then um, have you started on a hydro project yet? Yes, we have um, designs already. Um, we have contractors. We're moving very quickly on the hydro project because of that sunset date. Um, keeping in mind, I've only recently been in our term for the last three years, so we're making leaps and bounds. And as you project forward, do you think the 2030 date will be adequate? You'll have it done by then, substantial completion? Yes, we believe so. Okay. Okay. Irv, um, and thank you for being here, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Irv, I, um, you've been doing this basically your whole life, okay? You've been doing it with no resources whatsoever. What do you, you, you talked about fencing and water and feed and testing. Um, is, is, would this be done by grants to the people who apply for it, or how do you visualize this happening? What we do with the minimal dollars or funding that we do get, um, we have um, a herd development uh, grant process that we goes out to the tribes. They put in each year for all of their needs. Um, 
in which far exceeds uh, the dollars, the, the amount that we do get. Um, so they put in that and put it into their grants of what they would need for that year, uh, whether it be fencing, waterways, okay. um, and sometimes supplemental feed, the tough winners that we have, or the ones with uh, minimal land base. Okay. So, In the testing you're talking about, is that, I hate to bring up this word, but I'm going to say it, is that brucellosis testing or what kind of testing? Well, I, not necessarily brucellosis. I think the only place that, that we do have that is as in Yellowstone, but we do test um, the other animals that do come out of there uh, working with Fort Peck. But at, on uh, certain times, the tribes within the, the animals that they do have um, they like to do go ahead and do and test and just to make sure that their animals are all still uh, disease free. Okay, thank you. Um, just one last thing. I got thirty six seconds left. Um, I, I I do appreciate the fact that uh, both Porch and, and Litton got the delegation on board. It, it is so really really important that you guys have the home senators on board for this stuff. This has been a problem for you guys for a long, long time. And now I think it's gonna get fixed. And so I appreciate your hard work. And for you, Newland, it's always good to have you in front of the committee. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to those who have testified today. And uh, President Carlson, you mentioned our, our good friend, the great uh, Congressman Don Young. Uh, as it turns out, the 9th of June, just on Sunday, uh, was Congressman Young's birthday, and it's also the day that has been designated in Alaska as Don Young Day. Yeah. And so I think it's only appropriate that we are, are hearing this bill just so close in time to the Congressman's special acknowledgement. So thank you for recognizing him in that way. This is a question for you, um, Assistant Secretary Newland. And this relates to uh, the Indian Buffalo Management Act. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a program that we're looking to grow in Alaska um, to provide for uh, subsistence needs for several Alaska Native community. And uh, I mentioned transportation costs. You've spent enough time up there to know that this is real. Is it the department's interpretation of S-2908 that the bill will cover the cost of transporting? The, the, the bulls, the cows, and the calves to, uh, to the villages that are working to establish these bison herds. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, we believe that would be an allowable cost. Good. And is it also your understanding that the bill would cover the cost of transporting the bison within Alaska from village to village to promote sustainable grazing practices and herd health? Again, I, b I believe the answer is yes. Yes. Good. Good, thank you for that, that, that is important. Um, as I mentioned, these, ex these are expenses that are, are, are very real. Uh, another challenge though is the need for mobile processing trailers. Um, when you have communities that are not connected by road, you've got to move them uh, in other ways. Sometimes you can only do it by air or by barge. Is it the department's interpretation of the bill that it would cover the cost of transporting mobile meat processing facilities by air or barge to places like Old Harbor or Stevens Village, Village or other rural and remote areas? Thank you, Vice Chair. Yes, and I would say that within this program is, is I understand the bill. Uh, there is a lot of flexibility uh, for uh, tribes and organizations, our partners at ITBC, um, to do all manner of activity to both uh, manage herds and ecosystems as well as on the, on the back end with processing. Great, great. Your testimony states that the bill would allow the tribes and tribal organizations to enter into 638 self-governance contracts to assume uh, the BIA bison herd management functions. So does this mean that buffalo restoration and economic development activities would be managed like uh, 638 compacts that we see with tribal education or, or law enforcement. How do you envision that? Yeah, for, for tribes that want to use that route, uh, yes, it would work like any other 638 program. Okay. 
Okay. So are there, do you know if there are any uh, BIA livestock or wildlife programs that are somewhat analogous to the mm -hmm. Buffalo program that the BIA contracts with the tribes on now? I'd have to get back to you on that, uh, Senator, or Vice Chair, excuse me. Uh, but this is a, also a program uh, that we've been running on an annual, a year-by-year -year basis uh, with much less funding. Uh, so we've got good practice at it. And a $14 million authorization would allow us to, to grow it and really support uh, tribes that, that want to participate in it. Good. And pivoting just a little bit, uh, my last question to you uh, is regards to tribal applications for land into trust. Um, you had mentioned in your written testimony that the department must review each individual tribal application when requesting to place land into trust on a tribe's behalf. On average, how long does this review take uh, BIA to review an application? What are you looking at? Uh, on the whole, uh, we know that it, it takes us now around three years. Before the new regulations went into effect, it, it takes the BIA around three years to process a single application on average. So three years. So I'm, I'm looking then uh, to Chair Brian and... Uh, to, to Chairperson uh, Major, you know, what, is this, what does this mean when you have a three-year review plan, you're trying to, to put into place some, some plans um, for your people? Tell me the implications of a three-year review process. So we do appreciate the process and the administration and the revisions to 151. Um, these are lands that have been in trust for over a decade with the Department of Interior. Um, but that doesn't actually clarify these lands that we've had into trust. So um, we have not submitted any applications um, to place any land into trust just because we've spent millions of dollars on frivolous lawsuits and we've won all of those lawsuits, the people questioning the jurisdiction of our land. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Assistant Secretary Newland, the Crow Settlement of 2010 requires that the settlement be fully appropriated by June 30th of 2030. Um, this bill does not extend that deadline. Does DOI expect to fully fund the Crow Settlement um, by or before that date? Yes, Chairman. If, if I could just add very briefly, uh, that, set that settlement was $460 million. We are almost at 90% of the funding appropriated. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've got an additional $48 million in discretionary funds to go. Okay, thank you. And on S4000, the Lytton Rancheria Homelands Act prohibits the tribe from conducting gaming activities on the lands taken into trust under the legislation as well as on any future trust lands in Sonoma County. Would the gaming restrictions in current law apply to future lands taken into trust pursuant to S4000? Yes. That's all I need. Um, President Carlson, can you share more about how the Intertribal Buffalo Council's growing membership um, impacts the services it's able to provide? I think you've talked a little bit about this, but I guess there's two ways to look at it. One is how, how thin do you have to spread this $1.3 million? And the other question is, what are you going to do with 14 if we can pull it off? We have um, grown to 83 tribes now, and 1.2, 1.4 million. Um, uh, predominantly, that's been our funding. Um, so to get out, out to the tribes, uh, of course, I talked about the, the grants that we go through the process. And um, we try to, it's a, it's a process that every year that's really, we try to make it equal to all of our tribes, uh, all in need. Uh, consequently, it's never enough to, to really um, significantly, you know, in, or help their, their, uh, their programs. Um, some of the years we have, uh, not all of the tribes will put in because they'll, they'll hold out because uh, kind of alternate so other tribes can get a little more money to get their, their programs going. So it's very minimal, but... The tribes are very resilient. We've survived on that, that very little dollars, just as our buffalo are resilient and survive on that. So with 14 million, um, there's a lot of tribes that, um, that this, all of the tribes would be able to participate 
each year and significantly help uh, their programs. One of the things that we had a, a meeting with our, our herd managers and they were um, wanted dollars just to funding just to stay sustainable of what they're doing and not even able to uh, to grow their herds or to grow their land base for them or for all of the materials that they might need. So the 14 million would significantly um, increase, you know, uh, the help that for them. And I must say also that we do ask the tribes to tell us their full needs for the year. And it, each year it far exceeds 14 million uh, for what they really need. So we're still below on that. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Brian, if enacted, how will S3263 improve the band's ability to provide essential government sh services to your membership? Um, first, by saving dollars from frivolous lawsuits that we could use to provide housing, um, education, rural health care to communities, um, better infrastructure for our roads. Um, we currently service um, over 500 children at our Boys and Girls Club, and it seems to grow every year. So we would use those dollars that we're using on these frivolous lawsuits um, to continue to grow the community, be a part of a com the community. Um, when it comes to rural health care, there's a lot of issues there, people struggling, struggling with mental health. So that's how we would use those dollars. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have another question regarding the Litton Rancheria Homelands Act. Um, this was included in the 2019 NDAA law, and there was a gaming prohibition on trust land acquisitions for the Litton Rancheria in that language. As I understand it, S-4000 is meant to be a clarifying bill. Um, so does the 2019 prohibition on gaming in that law restrict gaming on any lands to be taken into trust for Linton Rancheria going forward? Yes, it does in Sonoma County. And we also have a standing MOA with Sonoma County that we would not prohibit gaming. Very good. Thank you for the clarification. Senator Danes. Chairman Schatz, thank you, as well as to Vice Chair Murkowski. I first want to thank you for holding a hearing on our Crow Tribe Water Settlement Amendments Act. I want to thank Chairman White Clay for coming all the way from Montana here to D.C. in support of the Crow people, as well as uh, Mr. Carlson uh, from the Blackfeet Tribe. It's an honor to have you here as well. Uh, thank you for, uh, for coming from uh, I know a neighboring state, South Dakota, but I know Montana in your heart there is, and uh, is a member of the Blackfeet tribe. In 2010, Congress passed the Crow Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act. It codified the 1999 compact between the Crow tribe, the state of Montana, that our state legislature passed with bipartisan support. Since 2010, the Crow tribe has worked with the Bureau of Reclamation to implement the settlement and to bring water to their people. Unfortunately, the original water project envisioned in the 2010 bill, it was found to be infeasible, the project that they defined in the compact, which is why we must make this really technical correction, a minor amendment to the bill. Let me be clear what this bill does and does not do. It does not alter any existing water rights. It does not add any additional funds to the settlement. It does not open up the compact agreed to by the state, the Crow tribe, and the federal government. What it does do is very surgically amends the 2010 bill to allow a little more flexibility for the Crow tribe to actually build a water system for their people in a way that's more cost effective, lower impact, and brings drinking water to the greatest amount of their people. I want to commend Chairman White Clay for his work on this bill and look forward to asking some questions on the impact 
of this legislation. Before turning to a couple of questions, I want to make one comment regarding the Crow Revenue Act. It's a separate issue. I will say I'm disappointed that my Crow Revenue Act was not included in today's hearing. This bill was made public and introduced the same day as the Crow Tribe Water Settlement Amendments Act. Both bills significantly help the Crow Tribe. Both bills are supported by the tribe, by the state of Montana, and by the communities. I truly hope that we can have a hearing on my Crow Revenue Act as soon as possible. Let's say July 10th might be a good date. <laughs> Assistant Secretary Newland, for the record, will you please verify that our bill does not affect existing water rights, does not add additional funds to the settlement, and does not alter the compact between the state of Montana and the Crow tribe. Thank you, Senator. It's great to see you again. Uh, yes, those are, those are all correct. Thank you. Chairman White Clay, the Crow Tribe Water Settlement Amendments Act and the Crow Revenue Act both bolster tribal sovereignty, increase energy security, and we both know fund much needed resources on the reservation. Could you explain to the committee why both of these bills need to be enacted this year and how they will affect access to services on the reservation? Thank you, Senator. Yes, both bills are detrimental for the tribe. You know, we, I believe both, excuse me, not detrimental, but it's detrimental that we don't have those bills in place. I mean, for the Crow tribe, this is a 10-year riddle for clean water across the, it's a basic human right. And to have all this funding and to not figure out how we can get water to every community and have to make that decision on which community doesn't get water, that's a decision no leader should make. So this bill would support all the communities getting clean water and the folks in the country that live in the country would have clean drinking water. The <clears throat> uh, Crow Revenue Act is a bill that basically keeps the tribe afloat for the next 10 years with the closure of our single source of revenue with one of our single sources of revenue, which is the Psalogat mine, which is now has no cus our main customer shut down. We have no revenue coming in from the coal, which would completely replace it. It would not replace it wholly, but it will make it viable for the tribe to find other sources of revenue and diversify our portfolio because a lot of the funds, the Crow tribe were not, we didn't get to participate in all the government funding that came down because of a problem that we had with um, a do not pay list that the tribe was unjustly put on. So all the good government money that was coming down and all the grants and all that we weren't available to participate in that. So all the services that we provide as on ourselves for social services, MMIW, Search and Rescue, Crow Tribe is ground zero for the MMIW right now. And we, you know, you see all the documentaries, all the missing and murdered, and that is all done on the general fund on the back of the Crow tribe with no input from the federal grants. We are on a reimbursement basis, meaning that to get federal funds, we have to expend our own funds to start with. So the Crow Revenue Act would actually give us some room to breathe on that, keep our head almost above water. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I have one more sentence to add as I close it out, Mr. Chairman, but I, I do wish... Um, those who have not been out to Crow Country, I'd love to see members of this committee come out and spend a day with you to see the, the serious issues you face as chairman. Uh, the poverty, the Mexican cartels, the flood effect. We talked about that today, the fentanyl coming. This is, this is an existential threat, truly, to the, you know, the economic viability of your people. So uh, my last statement is I ask for unanimous consent 
to add letters of support for the record, including one from Governor Gianforte of Montana. Thank you. If there are mo no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for their time and their testimony today. This hearing is adjourned.